Pac-Man was a cultural phenomenon. At its height in the 1980s, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who had not dropped a few quarters into their local Pac-Man cabinet. Something kept people glued to their screen, drawing them back for just one more game. Many things are responsible for Pac-Man's success, such as its appeal to a wider audience, or its break from the prominence of shooters in arcades, effectively creating a whole new genre that had never been explored before in any other game. And both of these are certainly factors in the game's success, but I wanted to take a look at Pac-Man from a design perspective, to find why this game has lasted over three decades. Today we are cracking open Pac-Man, specifically to analyze the AI of the four Phantom Pursuers, and why they are important today. Before we can cover the ghosts, we need to cover a few things first, starting with the maze itself. Before 3D gaming, video games displayed graphics using sprites and tile sets. Pac-Man was displayed on a screen with 224 by 228 pixels. So, with a tile set that was 8 pixels by 8 pixels, the screen would be split into a grid of 28 by 36 tiles. Not all of these tiles can be accessed by the player or by the ghosts, but they are still considered tiles nonetheless. These tiles are very important when discussing the AI of the four ghosts, but before we can move on to the ghosts, I want to briefly touch on how Pac-Man can take advantage of the tile-based nature of the game. When moving through the maze, if a ghost wants to make a turn, they need to move to the fifth pixel of any tile before they can begin moving in a new direction. Pac-Man, however, does not follow the same rule. Because Pac-Man is a very fast game, and humans don't have the reflexes of machines, the developers allowed the player to take a turn at any time, provided that a wall does not block the player. This allows players to make turns faster than the ghosts can, since they don't have to travel to the very center of the tile, putting a couple of pixels in between the player and the ghosts. The ghosts might have the advantage on the long corridors of the maze, but because of this move, commonly called cornering, Pac-Man has more of an advantage in parts of the maze where there are many twists and turns. The ability to corner is one of the tools that the developers have given that rewards attentive players who notice it and in turn can take advantage of it. Toru Iwutani also built other mechanics into Pac-Man that give the player a brief respite from the ghost pursuit. There are three modes of behavior that the ghost can follow. Chase, Scatter, and Frightened each of which changes the behavior of the four ghosts. In chase mode, each of the four ghosts switch to their most aggressive states, where they try to actively hunt down Pac-Man. Each ghost goes about this differently, but I will go more in depth about how each ghost targets Pac-Man later on in the video, but for now, just know that this is the mode where the ghosts aggressively try to hunt down Pac-Man. The second mode is scatter, where the ghosts reverse direction and begin moving to their respective corners. The top left corner belongs to Pinky, the top left to Blinky, the bottom right to Inky, and the bottom left belongs to Clyde. Scatter mode is designed to give the player a short breather, where they can get some of the riskier dots, or shake the ghosts, because Toru felt that a constant pursuit would be too stressful for the player. The ghosts switch back and forth between chase mode and scatter mode four times in every level. On level one, the ghosts begin in scatter mode and switch to chase mode after seven seconds of gameplay. Chase mode then continues for 20 seconds before reverting to scatter mode for seven seconds again. Once again, the ghosts chase Pac-Man for 20 seconds and then scatter for five more seconds. Following this, there is a 20 second chase period. Provided the player survives this, it will be followed by 5 seconds of scatter, and then an indefinite period of chase. Over the course of several levels, the chase time gets longer and longer, and scatter time gets shorter and shorter, capping at the highest difficulty level after level 5. You might have noticed that I said that there were three modes to each of the ghost's behavior. This third mode is Frightened Mode. Frightened mode only happens when a player eats one of the four power pellets, which makes the ghost turn blue and wander about the maze in a random fashion. Pac-Man can eat each of the ghosts for increasing amounts of points, 
starting at 200 points for the first ghost, and then doubling for each successive ghost. As the game progresses, the ghosts spend less and less time in fright mode, and after level 18, the ghosts stop turning blue entirely, and instead, just reverse direction. Through a combination of these three modes, the player is given brief breathers, but also adds another layer to the AI, making it a little harder to predict, and feeling a bit more lifelike, because the ghosts ebb and flow between chasing the player and running away. There are a couple of other quirks I wanted to cover before moving on to ghost targeting. There are two areas where the ghosts are unable to turn up, making them easily exploitable by the player. Also, when warping to the other side of the screen, the ghosts will have a much slower movement speed. These two quirks don't really relate to the AI, but I thought that they were cool and interesting and worth a mention. And again, they only serve to give the player a bit of a leg up on the ghosts. They are another pattern for the player to learn, and then take advantage of. As I mentioned earlier, each of Pac-Man's four ghosts feels different, almost as if they have their own personality. So you can imagine my surprise when I learned that each ghost uses the exact same pathfinding logic. This is where those tiles I mentioned earlier get really important. The only difference between each of the ghosts is the tile that they're targeting, but the logic a ghost would follow to get to that point would be exactly the same. Another thing that I should mention before moving on is that the Pac-Man arcade machine runs at 60 frames per second. This is important because each ghost calculates a new target tile for every frame of gameplay, meaning that the ghosts generate 60 target tiles every second. The ghosts also calculate what direction they should travel for every frame of gameplay, to match the speed that they get new target tiles. To determine the direction that they should travel, the ghosts look at each of the tiles that they could move to, eliminating tiles that have a wall and the tile behind them, as the ghost cannot turn around during gameplay unless it switches from chase to scatter mode. Then, the game calculates the ghost's target tile. Once the ghost has a target, the game triangulates the distance from each of the possible tiles that the ghost could move to and the target tile. The tile that is the shortest distance as the crow flies to the target tile is the direction that the ghost will travel into. In the case of a tie, a ghost will look at the two tied directions, and the one higher up on the totem pole is chosen. The hierarchy of directions goes up, down, left, right. The higher direction on that list is the one that the ghost will travel in. This is the basic pathfinding algorithm that all of the ghosts will use, meaning that two ghosts targeting the exact same tile from the same position would end up taking the exact same path every single time. So I've mentioned several times that the ghosts follow the same pathfinding AI, but the ghosts have different ways of finding a target tile. So let's look at each ghost's AI individually and see how they find their target tile, starting with Blinky, since his is by far the most simple. Of the four ghosts, Blinky is the most aggressive. In fact, Blinky's Japanese name, pardon the pronunciation, Oikake, means to run down or pursue in English, and the English version describing Blinky as a shadow is also quite accurate, as Blinky will shadow the player's movements. Blinky will always target the player's current location, and during chase phases, he will bolt as fast as he can in the player's direction. This makes him the hardest of the four ghosts to shake, and he keeps the player from cruising through the game without any challenge. But his targeting is not the only thing that makes him unique. Throughout the course of every level, Blinky will become more powerful. On the first level, once the maze only has 20 dots left, Blinky switches modes to become what is commonly called Elroy, though no one is quite sure where this name came from. While in Elroy mode, Blinky speeds up, matching the speed of the player. And if that wasn't enough, Elroy changes his behavior for scatter mode as well. While on scatter mode, each of the ghosts target the tile in their respective corners, though they will never reach their target because their targeted tile is outside of the map. However, Elroy does not target the corner, and Elroy will still target the player even on scatter mode. He still reverses directions initially like each of the four ghosts, but he is still targeting the player. 
But wait, there's more. When only 10 dots remain, Elroy gains another speed boost, this time making him noticeably faster than Pac-Man. If the player dies while Elroy is active, he will revert back to his normal blinky behavior until all four of the ghosts have left the ghost house. Pinky is described as speedy in the North American release. However, this might not be a completely accurate description, as her Japanese name is Machibuse, which is accurately translated to to perform an ambush. Ambusher is a much better description of Pinky's behavior, as she often seems to come from the front of the player, trapping them in between herself and Blinky, who is likely close behind. Pinky's AI is also quite simple. She just targets the tile four tiles in front of the player's current position and direction, at least most of the time. You see, when the player is moving in an upward direction, there is a bug in the code that causes Blinky to target not the tile four tiles in front of Pac-Man, but instead the tile that is four tiles above Pac-Man and four to the left of Pac-Man. Either way, Pinky is the easiest ghost to manipulate, as she can be sent on a wild goose chase simply by turning Pac-Man in the right direction at the right time. Inky has the most complex targeting AI of the four ghosts. He is described as the one who is bashful, though the Japanese version of his name, Kimagure, would be better interpreted as a fickle, moody, or uneven temper. With this being the case, it makes sense that Inky is the least predictable of the four ghosts. In order to calculate Inky's target tile, the game looks at the tile that is four spaces in front of Pac-Man, except when the player is moving up, where the same bug that also affects Pinky affects Inky. So when facing up, the game will take the tile four spaces to the left and up of Pac-Man. Then the game looks at Blinky's current position and effectively mirrors his current position around the tile four spaces in front of Pac-Man and makes that Inky's target. Effectively, as Blinky gets closer to the player, so will Inky, but it is a lot harder to predict than Pinky's movement. And finally, there is Clyde, the pokey one, but a better description would be feigned ignorance, based on his original Japanese name, Uroboke. As his name suggests, Clyde is the least threatening of the ghosts. That is because Clyde has two modes. Initially, he is identical to Blinky and will target the player directly. However, if he gets within eight tiles of Pac-Man, he will switch to scatter mode and then turn around and run back to his corner until Pac-Man is once again eight tiles away where he'll start chasing Pac-Man again. This means that Clyde is only really a threat when the player is in the lower left-hand corner, as he is less likely to get out of the way for the player. So why is this important for designers today? Why am I talking about the design of a game that came out 30 years ago? Well, as games move forward, I think it is important for designers to remember the importance of having an interesting AI, and in my opinion, Pac-Man has a couple of lessons for AI development. Firstly, Having unique behaviors for the various enemy types, all working together in different ways, can lead to a system that feels very nuanced and dynamic, even if they are governed by very simple rules. Pac-Man's ghosts are each very simple on their own, but working together they can surprise the player with their nuance. When playing Pac-Man, the behaviors of the ghosts mingle, making them feel varied and interesting without getting stale, even over many, many playthroughs. Secondly, Allowing attentive players to pick up on neat patterns and quirks of your game can be a very satisfying and helpful reward for skillful play. Pac-Man has a lot of ways which players can exploit it. Cornering, as I mentioned, is one of the most powerful tools that Pac-Man has, but leaving these patterns in your game can make your game more enjoyable to find the patterns and behaviors of the game. And finally, Giving your enemies interesting rules can add to their personalities, making them more interesting and memorable. Thinking back to similar games from this period, how much do you remember the aliens in Space Invaders? Probably not as well as you remember each of the four ghosts in Pac-Man. Sure, they were a horde of enemies, making them less unique overall as individuals, but they also moved in a uniform and predictable way 
making them feel unresponsive to the player's actions, and frankly, more boring than the ghosts of Pac-Man, which easily stand out with personalities that are represented and brought out through gameplay. Thinking carefully about the AI of your game can improve many aspects of it, and a designer should always keep their AI in mind when developing their games. This has been Design Deliberation. Feel free to like and subscribe if this sort of thing interests you at all. If you are really intrigued by the topic of developing video game AIs, check out this video from Mark Brown, which covers AI in a more general sense. Mark makes some of the best videos about game design on YouTube, so pay his channel a visit if this sort of thing interests you at all. I also wanted to announce that I have a Twitter account now, so if you don't trust YouTube to notify you when I release a video, then that might be a good place to get started. Anyway, this has been Chariot Rider. Have a good day. Thank you.